everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Scrubbed In Show. I hope you've all been keeping well. Today with us, we have another interesting guest. I'm sure many of you have used their platform. We have with us Joao, who is the co-founder of Ken Hub. He's leading the content side of things for over a decade and has, you know, been responsible for teaching over 2 million people. He's got a very interesting story, a story that, you know, spans across the world to a certain way. So absolute pleasure having you on the show. How are you today? To the show. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for, for having me here and on your podcast. I have to say this is my first time, so I hope I'm going to do well <laughs> enough for you guys to be able to no, produce the show. <laughs> no, incredible. Um, so we feel privileged to kind of share your story with the world. Um, so as tradition, we want to take it all the way back to when you were a young individual, you know, embarking on this journey um start from the very beginning kind of the motivation to go down this kind of medical route medicine um and then we'll take it from there excellent well it all start started when i was born so let's go no, <laughs> not that far away <laughs> uh, when i was, was four years old was, <laughs> yeah. was gonna say that's starting early but okay <laughs> yeah that would have been like a, a long podcast and probably people would fall asleep halfway through it uh but anyway uh well it essentially started um in high school i think when i i had to make a decision of what i wanted to do and I always knew that I wanted to do something related to medicine. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that with medicine, I also wanted to do something in mm. acting. Uh, and oh, wow. that, mm. which was completely different uh, from, uh, from um, actual being, you know, actually being a doctor. Uh, so I tried a few things also in acting. Uh, it was not very successful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, so I decided, okay, it's time for me to go to to school. Uh, after high school, I need to pick um, a university, a degree. Um, and I always knew that uh, I wanted to study something in sciences, in biomedicine or medicine. Mm. So that mm. I was always inclined to uh, find ways to um, to cure, basically, uh, because we all have stories in our lives where uh, we have family members that go through difficult situations and we yeah. want to be able to to help in whatever shape or form. So to me, to be able to contribute to the world of medicine, that, that was definitely on my to-do list. So I, I decided that I wanted to leave the Azores. I'm actually from... Uh, um, the islands of the Azores. Have you guys heard of? <laughs> Not really. No? Right in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so I, I, was, I, I lived on an island with 50,000 people, so we didn't have a lot of um, access to, to uh, resources like someone on the mainland, Portugal, would have. Mm. Um, but at the time, I knew I wanted to get out, uh, to get out in a good way, because I had a chance, uh, all my colleagues had a, the opportunity to leave the island to go and study on the mainland. That usually mm -hmm. was the, uh, what most of the people that uh, went to school with me uh, ended up doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I also had the opportunity to go to the United States. Uh, oh, wow. I always wanted uh, to to learn more about uh, the, uh, the language. I knew that there was a strong, um, a lot of strong things happening in the medical field there that I was always inclined to learn more about. Um, mm. So at the age of 17, I said, okay, I'm going to try both places one of them will actually <laughs> allow me to to leave <laughs> the island yeah. um and to pursue my studies so i happened to um i started i applied actually to this uh, summer course that uh, uh happens at harvard um and i applied just give it a shot you know sent my uh 
TV, my grades, my teachers all participated. They were like so happy and wow. very, you know, small town yeah, really the, vibes. The, the, the big shot all the way straight from an <laughs> island in the middle of nowhere to, to Harvard. Like, good on yeah. you. <laughs> but we're actually thinking, oh, this is cute. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but we never thought it would actually happen. But uh, <laughs> I ended up getting um, a letter, an ex um, acceptance letter, and then uh, went there, uh, started to get my, I got my foot on actually um, studying biology uh, mm -hmm. and pre-medicine. So, and I knew I was on the right path. I knew that I was definitely passionate about sciences and life sciences in general and specifically going more into medicine so and with time i knew that harvard was not the the best choice for me because uh you know small town boy going to big city boston i thought that i needed somewhere more peaceful where i could just you know handle all the pressure mm. of you know how, how was that experience of actually moving from a place with 50,000 people to a big city like America, you know, what was the culture like, you know, how are the people what, and you're at that age, very young, you know, kind of going into your adult life. How was that? It was, um, it's hard to explain. It's, it's something completely, uh, it's an out of body experience essentially <laughs> yeah. because you don't, I, I, you live for 17 years on a, on a small Island where you, um, you know, you know, everyone, everyone is, uh, you know, close to you. And, and then suddenly you're in the middle of a place where everyone is trying to, you know, uh, work hard to get their grades and move on with their classes. So there is mm -hmm. not much time to kind of bond and connect. Um, mm -hmm. And you feel a bit lonely in the beginning, uh, but then in mm -hmm. time, I started to connect more with uh, some of uh, uh, the roommates also that lived on the same um, the same place that I, I, I was living, um, connected with some of my schoolmates as well. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so I started making connections very slowly, uh, mm -hmm. but I still felt a bit overwhelmed with the city. And that's when I said, okay, I need to go somewhere very, you know, that mimics the, <laughs> you know, small town, but where I can still study and, and graduate. Mm -hmm. um, so I looked for a place in New Hampshire. Hello, mm -hmm. small, <laughs> small town in New Hampshire, University of New Hampshire. There yeah. were mm -hmm. like 15,000 people. So it was like, yeah, 15,000. 50,000, it kind of makes all <laughs> sense. <laughs> so, um, so I packed my bags, I transferred schools and ended up, um, you know, finishing mm. my uh, biology pre-medicine uh, degree there um, at the University of New Hampshire. At, at any point, Jawa, did you ever yeah. think the branding of Harvard was quite important? Because I can imagine you're at this massive institution, it's known globally um, did you ever think I should persevere and go through this? Or did you think, no, I need to look after myself and this is what I pre prefer? I didn't, this is going to sound bad, but at the time we, we need to understand, uh, put a little bit of context here yeah. because mm. at the time I, we didn't have access to internet, to the internet or Google like we do now. So mm. I didn't, going to Harvard was not like, oh, I'm going to Harvard. It was just like, Oh, I want to apply to a good a good school in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. What do you recommend? <laughs> Harvard is good, so <laughs> let me try there. So I only started to get a feeling of how uh, relevant or you know uh, how impactful Harvard is in the educational space when I went there and, and I actually saw people on campus uh, asking students to take pictures with them or asking them to just get into the dorms to take pictures of the dorms, which wow. was, I was like, <laughs> I, I couldn't understand what was exactly going on, but I, I knew that there was some sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, high Naughty. expectations. Uh, yeah. For mm. people uh, that went to that school. And of course I met really brilliant people that, um, and yeah, then not to, not to mention a little bit of imposter syndrome in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> 
it's all part of the journey. So you do undergrad in America, you kind of have this new experience. Um, you start to kind of get in your foot, start meeting people, start connecting. And then am I right? You come back to Europe again to kind of pursue education and kind of take it to the next level. Yeah, my, I, I, it took me a little bit of time because I still, I finished my, uh, my undergrad there, but then I decided to stay for a little bit longer to, to work because the goal was to stay around, get the green card, uh, and then maybe go into med school. Uh, that was the, the goal, but unfortunately, uh, I ended up, um, not being able to, to, to get the green card. It was taking longer than I, I wanted. Um, and, and honestly, it was, uh, a lot of hard work to get it. You would have to get a, a lawyer. It's a whole bureaucratic uh, mm. process. And then suddenly the click was when a friend of mine uh, who is not a big fan of the United States, he called me and he says, <laughs> listen, I got a green card because I applied to this uh, uh, lottery <laughs> <laughs> and I got a green card. And I said, okay, maybe the U.S. is not for me. <laughs> I've tried. I've given eight years of my life here, so I need to move on. This relationship is not working. <laughs> so, um, uh, And even though I love uh, uh, the place and I still do love the U.S., I needed to, to move back to, to Europe. Um, <laughs> and that's when I decided to then pack my bags and, and come back to, to, mm. to where it all started, basically. Yeah. So tell us about that journey. So you packed your bag, you know, you're, you're sick and tired of America, you know, they're not, you know, facilitating your career path. You come back to Europe. Tell us where you land and the next phase of this journey. Well, um, I first landed uh, in Lisbon and I started looking for jobs in my mm -hmm. field. So I knocked on a lot of doors and the, the majority of jobs available with my background were essentially research. Uh, so okay. a lot of uh, research opportunities. And I ended up accepting um, a job that wasn't the best job at the time, but I learned a few things, wh which essentially I was working for um, this big publisher here in Portugal that uh, translated a big, um, well-known um, uh, scientific journals. So I was essentially mm -hmm. translating, um, as, uh, for example, the American Journal of Psychiatry. Um, and, uh, and then I would work with a, a doctor that would uh, review my translation. And that was basic. It was, it was not a fun job, but it was a job. Yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> I was happy to have one at the time. Um, mm. But I knew always that I, I wanted to continue my studies. I wanted to go yeah. to med school. Uh, and mm. and that's the time when I started knocking also uh, on uh, trying to figure out how I could take that degree from the United States, come back to Portugal and get as much uh, validated to then practice medicine. And the process was not easy. So a yeah. lot of doors closed and I felt that it was time to, again, move on to bigger and better. Uh, yes. And that's mm -hmm. when I started looking for, for opportunities outside Portugal. Uh, yeah. And I looked for universities that had uh, English programs, so medical universities with English programs that I could transfer some of the credits uh, from the U.S. Awesome. Uh, and then wrap up some credits that are needed for the master's here in, uh, the, uh, in medicine here in Europe. So I can then practice medicine. So that was yeah. the goal. Um, and I then came across a program at the University of Pech in, um, in Hungary. Um, and it seemed that it was the best fit for me. I knew everything mm -hmm. about the program. It felt just right. However, I didn't know much about Hungary. I didn't speak the language. Uh, I knew a little bit of history, but not much about the country or the culture in general. Um, mm. So I, I, I knew I had one month to, <laughs> to <laughs> find out, yeah. to uh, Google as much as I could, yeah. uh, to get as much information I could, I could before I just packed my bags and then went there. And uh, I have to say it was 
an amazing experience. The first year mm -hmm. was fantastic. I met uh, some of the best people that I've ever met in my life. Um, and to me, I knew it was the right choice because I felt for the first time that uh, the experience I had in Portugal was not very positive because you come mm -hmm. from the U.S., with a degree and people are just like, it's not good enough. Uh, yeah. It's not good for Portugal. So, uh, so bye, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Uh, and then you go to, to Hungary where you feel like uh, you can continue your studies. There are lots of doors that could open after you complete uh, your studies. And I, I felt, okay, this is right. I'm in the right place mm. uh, now. Um, so yeah, that's how I get to, Hungry, mm. So, just a quick question. During this phase, obviously you were having setbacks and things weren't going your way all the time. How did you deal with that from a mindset point of view? Hmm. Yeah, it, it was, I have to say, uh, it was difficult. Uh, the transition from the US to Portugal, Portugal, Hungary, this time here in Portugal was very, very tough. I, I had good friends. That really helped me a lot and and uh, were a shoulder to cry on many, many times. Um, and the good thing was when I went to Hungary, I thought, okay, this is, uh, I don't speak the language. I I don't know anyone here. I'm a bit afraid that I, I come from this, uh, from a place that it was very tough, a tough time in my life. And then I have to adapt to a completely new reality. Um, but the good thing is that I met so many wonderful people, again, that became close friends and, and were, um, and became definitely the, the, uh, the pillar <laughs> for, yeah. for, for my, for my, you know, mental health, uh, in Hungary yeah. and for, for me to be able to keep up and continue my medical studies, which as you know, it's not easy. Uh, it's not an easy process. Jo Joel, question for you at this moment. So you've used the phrase yep. where you've packed your bags and you've moved on um, in search of this goal, this mission, this um, drive that you had. What fueled the ability to pack your bags and move on? So we have, for example, our listeners might be doctors in the UK. They're thinking about the Middle East. They're thinking about Australia, the US. But there's an element of fear. What gave you sort of the ability to pack your bags and move? I, the first time was definitely because I wanted something more. Uh, I knew that I wanted to mm. leave the island because I knew there was something better outside or more that I could uh, explore and, and grow. And even one day, if I wanted to return, I would have that experience. Yeah. So the second time around, uh, it was a bit of more like, I'm not happy here, uh, so I need to find happiness. And um, the, the, the what I had in mind was the only way out would be for me to uh, wrap up my studies. That would be one of um, one solution, let, let's say. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that once I wrapped up my studies, that doors would open. So essentially, yeah. is if. I, I wasn't happy where I was to the point where I needed to, um, you know, find um, a better place. And sometimes a better yeah. place is not a place where you're comfortable because I was comfortable. I was in Portugal. I spoke the language. I have family around um, and good friends. So I was relatively comfortable uh, in that sense, but I wasn't happy because I wanted to pursue more. I wanted to, mm. to do more. And I think that, um, that will kind of push me to, to say, I need to pack my bags and go and, and, yeah. and go somewhere else to, to pursue that. Uh, plus I also, I always had some sort of curiosity for what's out there, because when you grow up in such a small place, you tend to think, okay, um, there must be something uh, beyond this mm. huge ocean. There must be something else or something that you see on TV or you see <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. read on books. There, there must be. So you, you have to, 
the, the curiosity that I had to explore uh, things outside uh, my own country or the place where I used to live made me also um, um, take the, the leap and just go. So mm, I, I yeah. think my advice to, to people listening is that um, it's okay to go and try. There is nothing that... Um, the worst case scenario is that you come back to where you just left. <laughs> That's yeah. what I always thought. You can just <laughs> go back to where you just uh, left. And I always made sure that I left a little bit of a corner there <laughs> waiting yeah. for me. Uh, but that's the worst case scenario. And if you come mm. back and if it didn't go so well as you, you projected or you thought, uh, you will come back to, with more experience, uh, with, um, you know, more, yeah, more knowledge in general yeah. um, mm. th to be able to take the next step in your life. So mm. if, if that's something that uh, people are kind of, thinking, uh, of course, if you have something good here and you're happy here and maybe you will not take the leap and go, but if you are questioning, maybe it's time to take a chance. No, definitely. <clears throat> absolutely. So you're in Hungary, you know, you're, you're studying medicine and then I think things start to now get a bit more interesting for you. Uh, tell us this, this fight this 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 gruntledness you had with the, the the histology the world of histology tell us about this phase of the journey you know what i'm talking about right yeah <laughs> <laughs> but our listeners every, don't so tell the listeners <laughs> every student uh, the majority of students that i know every time they look at a histological slide and they say please identify this cell here they're like okay uh, sure <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, yeah. And it's like, for me, when I, I, start, I, I thought it was a beautiful uh, subject. Uh, when you start to understand it and to find ways to learn it, it's, it's a, an amazing subject. But it's very scary because everything looks the same and people yeah. expect you to identify and distinguish <laughs> things. And you're just like, I can't because they're all the same color and shape. And <laughs> so I cannot. Uh, so, so this was... Um, yeah, the time that I, I, I knew that I had to find ways beyond flashcards and, yeah. um, and uh, textbooks and notes, uh, things that, you know, the tradi traditional way of learning, I knew I had to do something beyond that. Um, mm. And at the time, I, was, uh, I bought a camera uh, with some friends, and we were making really silly videos. Um, for medical studi uh, students, uh, essentially uh, some parody videos um, that were not successful at all. And I have deleted them all, <laughs> I promise. Oh. <laughs> I didn't want to, to uh, have uh, one of those videos resurface at this time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but essentially, you get the occasional comments of, your colleagues say, what are you doing with your life? And then you realize, mm. okay, maybe I'm not going to do more of these videos. Um, but I knew that I wanted to do something with video. Um, and I, I thought, hmm, let me connect here the fact that uh, you, I have to learn this subject. I have to uh, connect with this subject somehow. So what is the, how can I do it in a fun way? And to me, fun mm. was producing a video. Mm -hmm. And so I started collecting some of the questions I had on flashcards and I started putting a video together. And I mean, the videos are incredibly boring. I don't recommend <laughs> anyone doing this kind of video, but it's essentially like one question followed two seconds later, you get the answer. It's like very amusing, engaging uh, format for <laughs> YouTube. Um, and that's the time I started posting them on on a channel that we had that uh, our, um, uh, me and myself, uh, me and my friends, we, we had this channel, which we called uh, uh, Salmonella Place, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it was essentially a restaurant where we used to meet, uh, where there was a lot of Salmonella poisoning stories. And we <laughs> said, let's call our channel Salmonella Place. I mean, a very clever <laughs> uh, naming, don't recommend. Uh, anyway, but I, I, I started publishing those videos there. Uh, and then suddenly I, 
evolved to other videos where I was mm. essentially um, taking inspiration from Khan Academy, uh, yeah. which is uh, using the you know the board on on just scre screen shooting the um, a board where you can write things and show some images. They were very mm. simple, uh, but they, they were effective for the time. I mean, they, they were new <laughs> for the time. Um, yeah. And the channel started to pick up and we started getting a lot of views um, and people were using the, those videos um, in our school, but they were also sharing with other, uh, other people that were learning in different parts of the world. So... Yeah, that was essentially how I think connected the two worlds that I just mentioned in the beginning. So I, mm. the the love of acting slash yeah. you know being on camera slash you know, uh, to to medicine. And I said, yeah. aha, mm. I I got something here. And yeah, what what was it about kind of YouTube at the time? What was it about video that kind of captured you compared to? textbooks, lectures, because textbooks, they've always been around. Even to today, they're around. It's the predominant way people learn. I'm sure things are changing very rapidly now. But what was it about video that you thought, I want to explore this, like we're onto something here? Uh, video was always something that I, I loved, not only to consume, <laughs> to yeah. watch mm -hmm. the series and, and uh, uh, movies, uh, but also I remember... I had trouble with anatomy uh, once, and I remember that one of the the things that kind of saved uh, me from <laughs> from the the, uh, the the actual exam was uh, was a video I watched on YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. or actually a collection of videos where they were actually showing cadaveric content, and I used those videos to uh, to learn things in more detail because. Uh, in our school, we used a lot of uh, cadavers to to learn yeah. anatomy. So, and it's hard to use a book to just yeah. you know learn that material. So, I needed something that would give me a full picture of what I was about to see, say, a couple of days uh, into the exam. So, videos really helped me. So, the fact that I already enjoyed consuming video content. With the fact that I had the actual experience of using video to help me pass an exam, for example, uh, and also to study, I, I knew that um, mixing the two worlds were was the right thing for me. No, definitely. At this stage, you're you're producing videos. You're kind of falling in love with kind of learning through this medium and it's becoming super popular and youtube was growing like wildfire at the time yeah. tell us how things changed what happened next that kind of probably changed the course of your life forever i'd like to say yeah absolutely uh it was an email <laughs> from my <laughs> from my uh co-founder the other co-founder niels he sent me an email he said i watched your videos on youtube uh, and I'm like, oh, someone is watching our videos. <laughs> uh, and we're, uh, we started this company in Berlin uh, where we're creating content for people to learn anatomy. Um, but the email was very short, even shorter than I'm. It was <laughs> yeah. probably one line. It's, I like your videos. Let's talk. Something like that. Okay. Uh, mm. <laughs> so I, I knew, I, knew um, I started uh, searching for for the website and it's completely different from what it is now but i started seeing what they were doing they were doing things already with the quizzes with the the images that we still have on the website and i knew that my gut feeling the first thing i i i thought when i uh, i looked at the website was that imagine if i could pair here the videos with this content with with quizzes and and these beautiful images. I think we could do something really good here. So mm. I got a chance to talk to them um, over Skype, very old school. <laughs> <laughs> so we Skyped and we talked uh, to Niels and, and the other two co-founders, Joab and Johannes. Um, 
And at the time, uh, there was another co-founder, Christopher, who who uh, was taking care of of content. And I believe he was uh, he wasn't on the call in the, the first time. But anyway, to say that we connected uh, and we decided to work on some things for the website. I believe the first thing we worked on was uh, translating some of the terms uh, from Latin to to English or something along those lines. Mm. And that was uh, something, yeah, a project, small project we worked together. Then we said, let's try videos. Let's try using some of the images that we have here <clears throat> for the lower limb and see how we can actually produce some videos, see if people are going to be interested in this uh, type of content. So we produced and um, and started publishing and we started to see a lot of interest uh, um, on the videos that we were producing. So with this, working on small projects together, we, we knew that we were a good fit. So we said, okay, let's work together. Let's make it official, people. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, what happened was they invited me to join as a co-founder um, mm. and I was the last co-founder to join. Um, and keep in mind, the other uh, three co-founders um, were, uh, are more, have a background in, um, in development and mm. marketing business uh, um, development as well. So um, I came in mostly as, the person with the medical background um, mm. and Christopher as well, because Christopher was um, was in med school at the time in Berlin. Mm. But at the time he was focusing more on his studies. So he took a step back and I focused, I came in then as uh, the full-time co-founder to help develop, mm. you know, all the content strategy for CanHub. Hmm. So at the time, we didn't have a lot. We had essentially, I think, the upper limb, the lower limb covered in with uh, with images. We're talking about this was around 2012. Hmm. Um, and we just had a, a lot of uh, beautiful images for, for those topics. <laughs> a few quizzes, um, very different than those that we have today, more simplified than those yes. that we have today. Um, and then the idea was for me to bring video, uh, to, mm. to Ken hub and to, to continue developing the content uh, strategy that, uh, we had planned together. This is all developed at an early stage of the internet. That's what I'm assuming it was 2010, 2012, right? Um, so I'm just thinking what made yeah. you go full time? on this, given that it's a very non-traditional route, it's not, now it's very common. People are able to go off and start ventures and bi uh, build startups, but you're doing this in a time where I would say you are probably amongst the first people to dabble in YouTube, be a content mm -hmm. creator and start this whole venture. What made you say, you know what, this is what I want to do full time and not be a clinician full time. What made you swing it to that side? I think, um, at the time, it was mostly, it was us, Khan Academy, um, uh, Dr. Najib, I believe, already had yeah. some content mm -hmm. out. So it was just a handful of people doing this type of content yeah. uh, on YouTube. So it was all untapped, <laughs> unexplored territory. Uh, and every time I'm, when I started, and I was still in school, I would ask a lot of my uh, professors at the time and uh, some of the instructors and even colleagues what they thought about, you know, what I was doing. Um, and the majority of answers were, uh, you could do better with your life. Just focus on, <laughs> just put, do medicine. Just stop that. That's cute. Yeah. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> you but should ask them again. What kept me going... <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've I've had some that have sent me some some messages asking for jobs, but okay. Yeah. We're gonna mention that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but uh, what happened? I think it was um, I always had a gut feeling based on what we had created and the reason why I produced those videos and the reason I wanted to join the team was the fact that I wanted to do. I wanted uh, education to be better. I wanted mm. 
medical education to be better. And that was always my goal. I wanted to co contribute uh, for, from, a, from a personal need as well, because I studied uh, medicine. So I also had uh, trouble learning some of the topics. Uh, and, and I wanted something completely different from what was being done, from the PowerPoint presentations in class, from, from the flashcards, from I wanted something better. So for me, I, with that in mind, I knew that I was on the right path. Um, and it was very risky because yeah. keep in mind that for, I would say, two, three years or even more, we were not earning money. We were not paying ourselves. Uh, the con we started making some money, but nothing that would make me say, oh, uh, it's time for me to go full time here mm -hmm. or even the rest of the co-founders. Um, but just enough to pay, for example, for people who wrote articles or for the illustrators uh, who produced, uh, who created the images that we use on the website. So mm -hmm. it was always a gut feeling that I was doing something right. Um, and that uh, the worst case scenario is that I would learn a huge lesson, <laughs> that <laughs> I would uh, learn that maybe medicine or medical education is fine the way it is. <laughs> Hmm. So I shouldn't have done anything to yeah. <laughs> to it. Uh, anatomy should be thought, taught the way it it, it was until that point. Uh, but then, yeah, I, we started to see that with the feedback that we got from students, uh, from from instructors, that um, you know people uh, started to resonate to, with what we were doing, and we hmm. knew that with that feedback. Uh, that we were doing, um, we were on the right path. I mean, yeah. when you get an email from a doctor in Afghanistan who says that he was using our images to to learn how to uh, more things about the anatomy of the hand, so they can work with patients who suffer from you know uh, bombing trauma, and that to me is like. Yeah. I don't know this person. They're yeah. you know, miles away from me, and they still use content that we produced uh, to learn and help save lives. To me, yeah. that was—I knew I could not. Uh, I had to stay until yeah. until yeah. <laughs> until it, it got proven that yeah. uh, it's a sustainable business. <laughs> Amazing. At this stage, it would be interesting to know how many users were using the platform. What were the numbers looking like back then when you kind of started this, this journey with TenHub? I, I don't have, um, I can't tell you exactly the, yeah, of course, uh, yeah. the number because, uh, yeah, <laughs> Niels is much better than the <laughs> numbers. But I could tell you that from what I remember uh, yeah. when we started, I, I, I remember when we were, we had 98 subscribers. Oh, time. wow. Mm. So it was uh, when very, we were, early. Uh, very early, yeah, during the, the I would say 2012, 2013. So it was not a lot, but we started, even Niels had um, uh, a sound that would, every time someone would subscribe, that the sound would pop up. And whenever we were working in Berlin, we would yeah. hear that sound. It was like a trigger. Yeah. <laughs> At a certain point, he said, please, you have to stop because it's too, yeah. ma too, yeah. too much. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> but at the time, it was we were talking about like five, ten people subscribing a day, which, oh, wow. which, which is not too bad, but, but, uh, but gave us a hope to, to yeah. carry on. Mm. Um, I think, um, yeah, definitely you could see the signals you had you knew you were having impact, not on a local level, but on a, on a population-wide level, um, an international level to say. So tell us about going from less than 100 subscribers to now having more than 2 million people across the world learning anatomy. The website looks incredible. It's such a great resource for people learning anatomy. Tell us about that stage. You know, how did you get it to this point? What were the difficulties and obstacles you faced? Because I'm sure a lot of listeners will be very keen to hear the, that segment. Oh, uh, we have time, right? Of course. <laughs> no, the, the, there are a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, obstacles that you go through this this entire time to go from the place where we were to all the way to now. Um, a lot of challenges, but. 
But in general, um, in the beginning, one of the biggest challenges was for us to move away from just having one or two people do content uh, because mm. it was mainly myself uh, producing content with someone who would write some of the articles and someone who would uh, create the images. So it was the, the, the first challenge was for us to hire. How do we hire? We didn't have much experience. This was also a challenge. There is no book out there that says how <laughs> to, uh, you know, especially at the time, uh, how how do you <laughs> create like your own med ed company? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so for us, uh, hiring was uh, one of the big challenges because we mm -hmm. wanted to do uh, the best that we could and um, and with with limited uh, finances as well. Um, yeah. So we wanted to be careful with how we spent our money, but then we started meeting great people. Uh, people who were very passionate about the platform. Uh, and we started connecting with those people and saying, okay, th if they are so passionate about what we're doing here, maybe they're the right people to come and join us um, and, and take this to the next level. And we started seeing that, okay, based on their background um, and also mm -hmm. experience and the passion, uh, passion they had for for med ed, we started hiring and working with people that would help us then expand the content. So um, it um, would help uh, me delegate and build different teams to then create the content that that uh, that we have now. But keep in mind, it's not a it wasn't an easy road because it yeah. got to a point uh, where. Uh, you're a small company, so you're wearing a lot of hats because yeah. you're on video, you're on, you know, produce, you know, reviewing an image, you're uh, reviewing an article or doing it all. I got to a point where for almost three years, three years, I didn't take any holidays. And it got to a point where I started to uh, get signs of burnout. Um yeah. And one of the co-founders, Niels, he sat down with me and he said, you need to take holidays. It's, there's no, <laughs> this is now mandatory. Uh, we're all asking you to take holidays. Um, and, uh, but thankfully, we're getting at a point where you have people that you can trust, that you can mm. take a step back. And this is when magic starts, when you have the right team, when you delegate uh, and you have uh, people that you trust that can take over some parts of your business and then you can do other things. I mean, th this is where the magic yeah. happens because yeah. at this point we've learned that having people full time um, working with us is um, and people responsible for, for different areas of CanHub uh, this is where we can really see the business grow mm. and take the shape that we now uh, definitely. See. I I do agree with the point where you can relieve yourself of certain juice and you can go to grow the business, grow the company, the platform it is incredible. How do you find these people, or when do you know it's the right hire? Because so many times company have brought on maybe someone that fits the role but isn't. And, you know, how do you get that healthy coach at work? Because I've, I've met a few members of the team already. I can have any, have a very nice vibe and culture and everyone seems to be super happy there. So tell us a bit more about that. Oh, yeah, that's um, a good question. Essentially, in the beginning, we used to hire a lot of freelancers. Mm -hmm. So that was an easier job back then because if things didn't work so well between us, uh, we could just say, okay, this is time to stop working together. Everyone moves on with their lives and it's okay. Even mm -hmm. though we didn't have many cases like that, we never had really bad cases of we have to fire someone. Um, but um, some of the things we've learned with time, it's something that you pick up with time because you first need to learn about what your company is all about. Mm -hmm. What culture do you have in your company and what do you want to bring in? So when you invite someone into essentially your home, you, you want to make sure that that person kind of fits some sort of criteria that they will come in and, um, and, you know, 
be part of that culture, be part of yeah. that team. So this is something that we currently do now that we move from freelancers uh, to full-time members because we saw a huge change uh, moving from freelancers to full time because people are more committed. They, mm. they, they, you know, they are fully committed to, to the, the, the cause and, and, and the company. Um, so what I usually look for is first of all, someone that, uh, easily communicates. So mm. I need someone who is, uh, able to um, open up about things that are not okay. So yeah. sometimes I I see as something good when I have I've seen like some candidates that I've hired in the past that yeah. essentially reported a mistake <laughs> on the mm. website. Oh, wow. And to me, that's a good sign because it tells me that not only they've been using the content. But, or the platform, but it also shows that they they are keen to spotting something that is that could be improved uh, mm. a, in your product. Uh, mm. So to me, that's usually a good sign. People who are proactive and that communicate uh, well. Um, and then, of course, background is important. Uh, it's important to have a background in the different areas where you're going to hire. But what we usually do is that, even though that is a very important aspect, is that you don't have many people that are uh, that have expertise in the new med ed world. Yeah. So it's not easy to find people who have worked. Now you start to see people yeah. who work for other companies in med ed, and then you they come to you know send you your CV, and you say, okay, they've worked in this company, yeah. so maybe we could hire them. Um, but in general, what we try to do is uh, either look for a portfolio. Mm -hmm. So if it's someone who is a medical artist or someone who has written uh, articles in the past, we ask for a portfolio or some uh, samples that we can look at. Um, and then we usually do a test task. Um, and a test task allow us to see how we work together. Mm. And it also allows to see if we're the best fit, because sometimes <clears throat> you might understand that that person is not the right fit for your company mm -hmm. because, you know, they are not communicating. Uh, uh, the feedback is is hard to kind of uh, we send feedback and it comes back with, you know, uh, the the corrections are not there is still the same. Yeah. So you, you start to see like some patterns with the. Uh, with the uh, sample tasks that kind of allow us to really yeah. determine if that's mm -hmm. the right fit. No. Um, and yeah, usually this, all these aspects, these elements that I just mentioned, usually they, they, they work to our advantage. We, we have been uh, spotting and hiring a lot of um, a fantastic talent. I mean, <laughs> Uh, it's probably one of the the best parts of my job is that I always say that I work with talented people, yeah. uh, talented people. Yeah. And oh, and one important thing: always hire people who are better than you. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that it, it, don't be afraid of that because people are like, oh, they're going to take my job. <laughs> uh, don't worry. Like if I want, uh, if someone is going to uh, come uh, and, and say, Hey, these videos are good, but I could do better. Look, yeah. let's do this. I had people in my team that have surprised me with lots of uh, ideas that I'm like mind blown because if we didn't have those people in our team, if we just hire people who have a set of uh, skills to just produce, and not mm -hmm. contribute anything else than producing uh, what you already set to do, then yeah, you're not going to go far. So don't be afraid to hire uh, people that are great at what they do. Mm, definitely. Yeah. And I think um, that's some good advice. The one thing I think a lot of people will be interested to hear and even us is what was that feeling like as a company when you hit that million user mark? When the the, the millionth person, the millionth user joined, subscribed, like, what was that feeling when, you know, I don't know how quickly it happened, but when you've worked at it for so long, so many years, you know, 
that that validation you know that we've built something incredible yeah that that it is um it is an amazing feeling feeling no doubt about mm -hmm. it um but because we work with online uh in the online world we yeah. never see actual numbers as in okay let me see this one million people here yeah. in front of me <laughs> yeah. uh, right it's always it always takes a minute a bit longer than in the physical world where you actually see more people lining up for your product yeah. um but then when you take a step back and you really think i have this many people uh, consuming the content that we produce this is crazy mind it's blowing. absolutely yeah. mind-blowing and and it's actually something that we we talk a lot with some people who we we have people who have been um in academia so they they uh have been instructors and one of the reasons sometimes during the interview that i <laughs> I either convince them <laughs> or, or try to get them to the, you know, <laughs> to this side of yeah, the world. To the dark is side. <laughs> to the dark side uh, is that I usually say, hey, um, if you teach at a, an, a university in a, a, anywhere in the world, you're going to have 100 people uh, in front of you per, per, or 200 mm. people in front of you per year. How about thousands yeah. or millions of people consuming your content and learn through the stuff that you produce. Mm. Uh, and that to me is that uh, a lot of people might say, no, I don't, it still doesn't change how I feel. Uh, but a lot of people uh, connect with that because the power that you have to produce a piece of content that can be consumed by many students around the world is something that is um, very appealing for a lot of people that learn medicine or or anatomy uh, uh and want to teach uh so yeah. so that's yeah very no. appealing that that's so. incredible the, the final few questions i know you're super busy before we let you go is so now you're leading content video you know content creation but you're also a leader right and it's there's very different types of leaders what makes a good leader Clearly, you've been a good leader. You've been super successful. You're churning out a lot of high quality content. What are your tips and advice on, on, on leadership? Yeah, first, I, I would like to clarify that um, I'm mostly focused now on video production. So hmm. I am uh, mostly leading all the, uh, uh, the majority of video production at CanHub. Um, mm -hmm. So we have other people that lead other parts yeah, of yeah. the company, especially. Mm. But, uh, but in general, I feel being a, a, a good leader, if I'm one, I hope I am. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find uh, out. No, we'll even find us. Out. Yeah, so you you know, to, oh, he was a good leader. <laughs> yeah, you need to, to ask the rest of the team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but in general, I believe it's, it's about listening. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot uh, to do with listening and not just uh, putting your... Um, your expectations on the table and say, this is how I want it to go. Mm. Uh, if you listen to what people have to say, um, and usually if you surround yourself with people that have good things to say, and uh, even good things to say could be bad things, saying, no, this is not the good direction, but surround people that give you good advice, you can gain so much from it because you not only you build a great connection with your team, but also you're able to, to take from different parts of your team and, um, and produce something that it is better than you had in mind. Um, mm -hmm. So I think a big, a big part of being a good leader is to listen. The final question is on this journey, which you've done for more than a decade, trying to innovate, trying to improve medical education, what have you learned and what, advice would you give to other people that also want to improve medical education? It might not be anatomy, it might not be through video content, it might be through other things, you know, VR, AI, so many different things have come to the market in the world. What advice would you give to them? My advice is that everyone learns differently and it doesn't mm. matter. Uh, you cannot say that someone is not going to be a good doctor just because they cannot uh, digest 
the content or the material in a certain way that, you know, is, is put in traditional educational systems. So it's just keep in mind that there is a lot of room for improvements in education. There is a mm. lot that can still be done because every person learns differently. So you could be today starting um, a platform or, or creating a physical product even that helps people learn that could um, cater to say 100,000 people that are very, you know, are very niche, but is, it's still uh, good for those people that need to learn in a certain manner. So uh, to me, that's, I think, the biggest lesson I've learned is that there's still a lot to be done because everyone is different and everyone learns differently. No, definitely. And I, and I agree with you. Um, João, thank you for taking the time out and coming on to the show. You've, you've had an incredible journey, you know, someone that grew up on an island in the middle of nowhere with 50,000 people to now being part of this incredible platform that is teaching millions of people across the world, I think is incredible. Um, we wish you the best and we, you know, we hope to, to do another episode when you hit 10 million. Um, we'll bring you back in. We'll do it in person. We'll come to you. We'll come to okay. you. We'll come to the GetHub office. That's We're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the deal. Um, but thank you so much Joel, for taking the time out. Thank you for the listeners. Um, we have a few things coming up with Ken Hub, which we're excited to share soon. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, definitely check it, Ken Hub out and, um, you know, let us know what you think of this episode. And thank you so much for having me here. Seriously. This was my no. first time. So and <laughs> you, I have to say, you guys treated me really well. So thank you. <laughs> oh, absolute pleasure.